Sure. We've got a double dose of X-Men today for you on Collider Movie Talk. First up, we're doing our box office recap, and we're going to tell you how Dark Phoenix did. And then after that, we are rolling into a second Dark Phoenix story because there are a ton of juicy behind-the-scenes details that we're eager to get into, figure out what exactly happened with that movie, and then speculate what the right moves for the X-Men film franchise might be going forward. And... I am Perry Nemiroff, I'm your host, but I get to sit here at this table with two wonderful people who I love doing this show with, John Roca and Haley Fouch, your smiling faces. Yeah. Fill my heart with joy on this Monday. Oh yeah, we're not the director or producers of Dark Phoenix, so we are smiling today, that's for damn sure. At least it's an interesting discussion to have. I am never rooting for a movie to fail, and I did actually teeter positive on Dark Phoenix, so it's a bummer to see this franchise fizzle out quite like it did. But so it goes, and hopefully there's still a bright future for these characters on the big screen moving forward. To recap the full box office lineup right now, we have The Secret Life of Pets topping the charts with $46.7 million. Number two went to Dark Phoenix with $32.8 million. Three was Aladdin with $24.7 million. Four was Godzilla, King of the Monsters with $15.5 million. Rocketman came in at number five with another $13.8 million. Roku, you see yeah. this lineup here. What stands out to you? Well, to me, uh, you got to look at that. Who in their right mind would have ever thought the Secret Life of Pets two would defeat and Oof. would defeat X Men: Dark Phoenix? Even after Apocalypse, you thought they'll get it right. The public will come back. They did not. But the other, we'll talk about all of that, I'm sure. But Aladdin is the one I want to give a shout out to. That thing crossed 605 million worldwide. That's incredible. Everyone thought this thing was going to bomb. Everyone did, and look at it doing its money. So those people in the small minority who are complaining about these live-action remakes hate to break it to you. You were in a small camp because a lot of people are coming to see these films and enjoy them. So Aladdin, props to Disney for doing that. It was a very pleasant surprise, yeah. and they're doing well with it. And actually, agreed. looking at this top five, that seems to be the only one that is yeah. in good shape because yeah. you bring up Secret Life of Pets. Secret Life of Pets, no doubt, like months and months ago, was always going to top Dark Phoenix to me, even if Dark Phoenix oh, did better. But gotcha. forty-six point seven million dollars is extremely low for Secret mm-hmm. Life of Pets 2, especially when you consider what the first movie made. It was $104.3 million. This is less than half of that. And I have a feeling Universal and Illumination thought this was going to be a juggernaut of a franchise for them. And it's a little bit surprising to see that happen when they both had the A-minus cinema score. And then on top of that, this one seems to be getting better reviews than the last Mm. one. So even though I missed out on it, so I can't make an opinion on the quality of the movie for myself, I'm, I'm a little sad to see this one not get the love it could Mm. possibly deserve, especially based on Dave's glowing review on Collider.com. But, (laughs) you know, you think about it, I believe that first Secret Life of Pets movie still has the opening weekend record for original animated movies. Mm. And I don't know, I like original uh, filmmaking, so (laughs) I wanted to see this one do well. Well, it's not. I mean, now it's a sequel of an original thing, right? It's I guess so. Quite it's still part of a. It's part of an original <laughs> franchise yeah, 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 that totally. isn't based on anything. Uh, I feel you. How you uh, feeling about a uh, Godzilla right now, Haley? I know you're a big fan. Uh, oh, I mean, it's it's a bummer, right? There's yeah. no way around it. Uh, last time I was here, we were kind of talking like, well, we'll have to see how it continues to perform overseas, and it's just not doing it it has one market left in spain which is not going to move the needle in the way that you know if their last market was china or something i'd say like oh it still has a chance it could Mm -hmm. it could do big numbers it's just not it's not going to happen it's sort of bombed out and i'm i'm sad i'm glad that we already have a guaranteed one Mm. more in the monster verse because if that doesn't do if it doesn't move the needle i don't think we're going to see anymore yeah i was a little disappointed to see that as well because i was thinking that maybe it had a chance of holding on a little better than it did in the states given the fact that you know when i was busy sitting there comparing it to kong skull island and the 2014 godzilla movie i'm like well this movie doesn't have as much to lose so that Mm. means we're going to see a smaller percent change that's actually the highest percent change of the franchise now what is it 67.5 percent that is a huge weekend to drop especially for a movie that opened as small as that one did. Well, do, does this put the other one in question? Yes, they said it's still coming, but do, do you now push it back? Remember, Potter did that. They've pushed back they, their installments. Will they push this one back, work the script a little bit more out of fear because of the box office returns? It's already, I believe it's shot. Oh, wow. Uh, if it's not shot, it's ending right. filming mm-hmm. at the moment because they've been in production for quite a while. Fascinating. Yeah, uh. so they're, they're in. Yeah. Like They got to roll it out and maybe... 
I don't know what you guys think if it was a marketing thing or if it's just we don't care about these kinds of monsters the way that we care about dinosaurs. I, it's it's interesting. I, th- I think people were burnt from the uh, from the Kong Skull Island was kind of half and even half yeah. un- it was uneven and so was the original Godzilla. A lot of people didn't like that Godzilla one too. So I think it just got I think it caught up. Finally the audience is caught up. Like people complained about the Transformers movies. Eventually that last one last night was where the fans were like that's enough. I'm I, yeah I'm done. I wonder how this one does because none of these have been reviewed extensively uh, in a in a great way. No. So I don't want to take away any kind of, you know, blame for the quality of these movies, mm. the franchise, the general lack of interest in certain topics. But given the fact that we're also talking about Dark Phoenix this episode, I am wondering if we're starting to feel the effects of an overcrowded marketplace. Mm. Because That's this fair. summer in particular, every single summer is packed. We usually have one big release every single weekend. But this summer feels... I mean, almost like out of control, like there's really no room to breathe. And we always talk about how important having legs are, but now Mm. there's really no opportunity to have legs. So I just wonder if some of these lower numbers that we're experiencing right now is just kind of a sign of the times and where we're heading in the future that if you are not the biggest of the big, if you don't make the most noise at the box office, your chances are just diminishing. Yeah. I mean, it certainly seems to be heading that way. Mm. And then I think it comes into a factor of like making smart choices, knowing that is the case. Like then you keep your budgets down, you keep your marketing Mm -hmm. down, do maybe more of a grassroots marketing campaign than the plaster, the posters on every billboard in Los Angeles type thing, you know? And because there's there's room, even with the demands of a monster film, to make a lower budget version Mm -hmm. of these movies Mm -hmm. that then these numbers, especially the overseas numbers, become great instead of disappointing if you keep your budgets in the right realm. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of factors in play, especially when we talk about the variety of movies on today's box office list, but steering into uh, Dark Phoenix a little here. So Dark Phoenix came in well under expectations, and not only did it not meet the studio expectations for the weekend, but it is officially the lowest opening for the X-Men film franchise. You're looking at the chart right here. I thought it was going to come in just behind number nine, which is the Wolverine. And I think I wound up predicting something like a $45 million start for this movie. Whoa, that is a big gap, though. It is a major, major difference here. So we're going to dig into all the details about why this might happen in story number two today. But just your initial impression of a number like this, when you saw those box office numbers come in, what was your first reaction? Hello. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I wasn't surprised at all, to be honest with you, because it always felt like a lame duck yeah. film anyway. And it's like when they cancel a TV series four episodes in, how much time? How, how many people are going to come back and keep watching the series and invest the time? We all knew they're not going to bring any of these people back. Most people knew that this is the end of the line for it. And the 22% or 21% of Rotten Tomatoes was the nail in the coffin to me. So I I wasn't surprised by this, to be honest with you. Yeah, it should have been higher, sure. But I wasn't like, oh, my God. I'm not shocked, but it's Mm. still the the impact of that number. is still like, whoa, Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, y'all messed up. And (laughs) I don't, I like that's what all these reports are like what could they have done different what went wrong everybody's sort of investigating that but there's also just as you mentioned this feeling that like there was no energy around it Mm -hmm. you barely even like felt that there was an X-Men movie coming out at all. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of details that we're going to dig into right now, including something that Jesus Gastelum is asking for in the live chat right now. How much did those reshoots cost for Dark Phoenix? So we're not going to get into those specifics, but we do have a ballpark movie, what the studio spent on Dark Phoenix, and we're going to talk about that in story number two. But right now, I've got something you got to keep your eye out for on the Collider Video YouTube channel. Check it out. Hey guys, Riley here, and let me tell you about Rule of Two. You looking for a Star Wars fix? Well, Rule of Two is that show. It drops on Collider Video's main YouTube channel, as well as on Podcast One's Jedi Council feed. So go over there, subscribe, share it with your friends. It's hosted by myself and Mark Fernandez. We talk everything in the Star Wars universe with a lot of deep dives and a lot of conversations that go all in. You know what to do. Subscribe, join us there, and rise. In addition to Rule of Two, we also have a ton of E3 coverage coming your way all week. You're going to get it on the Collider Games channel, the Collider Video channel, and also on Collider.com. So you're going to want to check all of that out. And then on top of that, follow Instagram because Dorian is going to be posting some stuff from E3 all week. It's a lot of fun. You got to check all that out, especially 
Dorian's drinks. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're enjoying that. All right. So we're number two here. Let's hit Dark Phoenix from THR. They posted a big postmortem today detailing a whole bunch of insider information they got based on the production. So according to this article, a Fox insider told the outlet there was a misguided feeling that Apocalypse was an anomaly, that we just got it wrong. And at first, the movie release date was November 2018 for Dark Phoenix. After that, we know it was pushed to February 2019. Then, with marketing already underway, Fox pushed the release date again to June 3rd, 2019. Ins actually, it's June 7th. Insiders tell THR that the move was actually to placate James Cameron and his concerns for Alita Battle Angel. The problem is, according to the THR piece, that Dark Phoenix was never Ever designed to be a summer movie. So, Roka, mm. what is your take on this little first bit of information that we're covering right now? I'm, I'm wondering how they could be so misguided to not know that there were problems with this X-Men franchise from the beginning. There have been issues. I mean, Last Stand did not do that well. Then you hire the guy who co-wrote Last Stand to be in charge of the Phoenix story again, and then you get, make him direct the film. Then you do reshoots over and over again. Like, all of that just to me signaled a, a, a demise for this film and then you start pushing it to placate james cameron which to me makes no sense for a film like alita battle angel that had absolutely no buzz and no one was going to see this thing in large numbers so if they were either playing the long game to placate him because of avatar uh, and then they sacrificed uh, Dark Phoenix, which should have been their a great ending installment of this franchise uh, in exchange. And that, I think, they're just massive mistakes all around. But them lying about, well, I'm sorry, my belief that they lied about <laughs> this idea that, oh, we saw Captain Marvel. We didn't want to make it close to Captain Marvel. It's all smoke and mirrors. They knew they didn't have a good product. They knew they couldn't get it right. And they just dropped it. And this is the result. Well, Deadline actually also ran a report on some of the behind the scenes stuff mm. on Dark Phoenix. And according to their report, the claims that the ending was too similar to Captain Marvel just wasn't true. No one on the Fox slash Dark Phoenix production side had any intel of what Captain Marvel would be like before it was released. Yeah, that could that yeah. could have been the case, but also in terms of the release dates being pushed and pushed and pushed, and that mm -hmm. final last push to let's say maybe placate James Cameron. I mean, at that point, what's the big deal? Yeah. That seemed to this movie seemed to have been such a low priority yeah. for them at that point, and also the merger was a done deal. Big deal, especially if someone like James Cameron, yeah. who is such a formidable, strong force in this industry, I could understand why they would want to appease him and move this thing off its date. But the concern that they had about this never having been a summer release is fascinating yeah. to me. And it's all, it almost goes back to what I was saying at the end of the box office segment. I feel like that's the game some of these studios are going to have to play with certain franchises is you're going to have to start designing things for other times of year because, yes, the whole year-round calendar is overloaded, but summer in particular is almost like dooming your movie because there is just so, so much out there. Mm. It's also a matter of kind of what we were talking about, this complete lack of buzz. I do feel that by continually pushing it, redefining the film, there was no clear marketing for it. And I'm really surprised. I thought Disney, once they had it, was going to lean all in on like the last one. This is your last fire sale. Get your last X-Men before we pull it off the market for a while. But they didn't lean into that. So there was no hook to hang on to. And when you keep pushing your film like that, I think it signals to audiences just as much to everyone else what you said, that it's not a priority. It's not a priority for the studio. Why should it be a priority for us? That's mind blowing to me. This is a premier franchise. Yeah. And the fact you treat it this way for the chance that these Avatar films might be good. We haven't seen Cameron in the theaters in years. <laughs> and all of a sudden you want to sacrifice this thing. It's insulting to the X-Men brand that a lot of people, comic book lovers like me, love and adore and revere and go see these movies. And for it to be treated like this, it's just a horrible sign all around. So now that's why we're even more doubly excited that it's going to Disney and the MCU. And we'll see what they do with it down the road. I'm having a hard time pointing such a strong finger at anyone over at Fox just because, you know, maybe it would have been an issue for that original release date way back when. Mm. I like I forget when they were in production versus when the rumors of the merger first started to emerge, but if it hit a point where folks over at Fox were just like, well, we're going to lose our jobs anyway or we have no focus and we have no leadership because mm. that deadline report also talked about just confusion in the marketing department. Who's to blame them for kind of dropping the ball a little, especially when there's no hope or direction for this iteration of X-Men in the future? Yeah, I, it's 
how do you sell that product? I mean, it, it, at a certain point also, when something has been on the shelf for so long, that's, that says something to audiences, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Then how does the marketing team convince them that all the connotations are not accurate when the material itself is kind of meh? Yeah. It's very hard. So I don't just point the finger at marketing, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a factor. I don't think that anyone really knew what to make of this film, including, it seems, the people who made it, which is, then yeah. how do you sell that? Well, the reshoots, right? Why do you waste the money on the yeah. reshoots in a vain attempt to try to save this film? It doesn't make any sense at all. If you knew it was going to crash anyway, just drop it as it is and move on. That's the thing that I don't understand overall. Very Speaking. curious to see what they do with New Mutants. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah, so am I. <laughs> Speaking of the money, though, Deadline is predicting that this one is going to, they say it will burn out with an S estimated $100 million to $120 million loss after ancillaries <laughs> off a combined production and P&A estimated cost of $350 million plus, which includes the reshoot. So mm -hmm. this is a, a pretty significant loss right here, and I wonder if it will change plans for New Mutants. Again, I still stand by what I said the last time we covered New Mutants, which is if Disney is going to go ahead and let those reshoots happen, you don't bother doing that unless you have some faith you're going to get a return on it, mm -hmm. whether it is going as far to incorporate it into the MCU or even just try to just turn out a single standalone good movie. But we also have a question in the live chat from Steven Geo, who wrote, now the X-Men have to share the production budget and schedule with the MCU, will they be able to give them the breathing room they deserve? So with that, with that kind of question, it's difficult because I don't know the behind the scenes mm. details about how Marvel Studios breaks down their budget, but I mean, yes, they will have to share it to a degree. And that's part of the problem, again, with the overcrowding at the, uh, at the theaters now is that now it's also like, Disney overcrowding and you got to think yeah. about all the different departments mm -hmm. they have and even though yeah maybe they're staffing up a little more so than they were before but there's only so much time and money and energy to go around so it could be a little bit of a challenge to spread all these movies out mm -hmm. over so many years I don't think there's a rush I, I really don't, don't either I think people want to let it die for a little while the Spider-Man thing was an anomaly and it got and the MCU got lucky with that by getting the right Spider-Man and Tom Holland do whatever, but people were dumb with Spider-Man and they were able to bring him back slowly but surely and now he's he's back in uh, being a permanent place in, in the MCU. But like, this is a weird situation with X-Men. I think you'd let it die for a little while, build up how you want to cast it, whatever, find your way to the X-Men organically through what you're already creating and then release it. You got to wash the taste out for all. Same thing with Fantastic Four. There is no rush to release mm. a movie like that this quickly. Let me reshape this pitch for you a little because okay. I think what Steven might be getting at or how I kind of read his question is over the past couple of years we've gotten those many MCU movies mm. and we've gotten these many X-Men movies. Now that they're all together, is it possible to still maintain the same numbers? No, and I don't think that'll be the intention either. I think that uh, I agree with what you said mm. which is that they're going to give it a big rest yeah. because it, uh, for all the reasons you said and it just, they don't need it right mm -hmm. now. Number one reason is they're very much thriving, very successful. And I think it was the THR report that, that had a quote from someone saying they're, they're going to take their time with it. And when they do introduce it, that's 10 more years of MCU movies that are, you know, just by having the X-Men, you've got a decade more mm -hmm. of filmmaking to mm -hmm. do. So I think that they will integrate it into the plans for the MCU, not not say we we have our MCU movies and then we yeah. have our X-Men movies. I'm definitely with you guys on that. One other point that I did want to bring up, which I found very interesting in that Deadline article, was there was a point where they said Dark Phoenix was originally planned to be two movies. <laughs> and that seems to me like it could have been the better path to take because one of my biggest issues with this particular story is that you needed a stronger foundation with the newer characters in order to... To justify oh, yeah. this big moment for Jean yeah. Grey where her relationships with these people are called into question. So maybe stretching it out over the course of two movies was the better way to go. And they were saying that uh, Kinberg basically played ball with the studio in those requests. And I wonder if it would have been an opportunity to creatively fight for the better path to have taken with the story. I mean, maybe, but judging how, by how the, all this happened with exactly. Disney and anything, yeah. that would have maybe been even worse and we're left with no ending. Uh, That's a fair point. I mean, maybe mm. we wouldn't have gotten a movie at all. Yeah, then. exactly. Yeah. I, I, it, 
needed the space to tell the story. Yep. I think definitely, even just right out of the gate, there's like one scene and then it's like, boom, you're off into this adventure that you've been wanting to see forever, but yeah. you don't, there's no time to get hyped about the idea of the X-Men in space and all this cool stuff that this movie was supposed to present because it's move, 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 move. Well, and, and the X, these, this new batch of X-Men was never the, the leader of these films, yeah. right? It was always a po- it was Apocalypse, it was Wolverine and Days of Future Past. It was Xavier with a, a Fast and Magneto with Fastbender and McAvoy. It was never this crew of actors, and so they that doesn't drag you into the movie. It doesn't drag you into seeing this thing. And if they had stretched it out over two movies, that would have made sense to let us connect with these people a little bit more mm-hmm. playing these characters then you can understand something like dark phoenix happening and feeling as feeling it as a tragedy and they didn't have enough time to build it up just like they did the first iteration of x-men they fumbled this dark phoenix story twice what is the damn rush <laughs> let them breathe let them have adventures and move to it marvel just showed you the blueprint 10 years to get to the thanos story it, it can take time let us enjoy it and they never do speaking about that to wrap up this segment i have one prediction question for you guys how long do you think it will be until we see the dark phoenix story back on the big (laughs) screen 20 years it's inevitable i I feel like it's gonna and i feel like it should why waste this rich story just because it wasn't done properly especially if you earn it but you have so many ancillary characters that are attached to the dark phoenix story that that you need to lay the groundwork for a very fair point coming coming from someone who doesn't read comics and is just told about some of the most popular storylines and a popular Mm. storyline that excites me but i guess in my mind at this point it is a shame that we never got a really strong version of this tale on screen. I thoroughly agree with you, and we'll see what happens as the MCU. They may start laying the seeds for it down the road, but I think you say Dark Phoenix, people not to ha- start to have like little face twitches yeah. now, and nobody mm. wants to see it for at least 20 years, at least. At least, and I don't think that's the direction they will go based on what they did with Spider-Man, yeah. which is we will not tell that origin story again. Right. You know it, we're done, we're right. not doing it. And I think that's the the smart move, yep. and it obviously paid off with Spider-Man. It's a shame that we didn't get Dark Phoenix, but like, there's a lot of X-Men stories out there that are really oh, sure. cool, and I think we can branch out from this that makes, like you said, everyone House, just go, oh. There's so much. House of M, you've got the scrolls yeah. now. We can definitely play with the scrolls. There's so much to play with in the X-Men universe that you can lead the Dark Phoenix storyline for a while. All right, I look forward to seeing what they do and I'm still waiting not so patiently for New Mutants. All right, (laughs) let's take one quick live chat question. I'm going to go for one from Ghost World who's writing for Dune. I just finished reading the book very much like Game of Thrones. Would this be better as a Netflix miniseries instead of a film? There's a lot to explain. Funny you should ask that question because you know what just broke right before we sat at this desk. Here's the headline that I've got here from The Hollywood Reporter. Dune the Sisterhood TV series a go at Warner Media. So an announcement for a Dune TV series before we get the new Dune movie. Is it a good idea? Is it too much too fast? Well, a few years ago, someone came out and said, I'm going to have one Power Rangers I knew you were going to do it. I knew you were going to say it. Don't your chickens before they hatch. (laughs) For God's sakes, get it right once and then start talking about a TV series. Uh, uh, Drew McWeeny and I on Mailbag a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this, and him, who is a man of knowledge, and was like, I have a real fear of how people are going to consume Dune because it's such a massively dense book. Mm -hmm. To now start turning it into a miniseries to accompany what you've got in the film here, it's very, very... Very dangerous. I, I think it's the t- highest of high wire acts to pull off because it is a dance dance book. It did not go well for the Dark Tower. <laughs> yes. So that's Another a recent point. example of why you should probably do one thing really well before building an empire around it. I have more faith in Dune because it is Denis Villeneuve sure. and and I can see why they want to do that. Do I want to see the series? Sure. Do I believe it will happen, especially based on the numbers that Blade Runner got? TBD, Mm y'all. I can't wait until the first uh, think piece that comes across my desk with the headline is Dune Doomed. Someone's going to think they're really clever with that one. It's not going to be me. All right, guys, that is a wrap on our show today. A huge thank you, as always, for brightening our days on Monday. Adam in the booth, thank you so much for your hard work. Same to you as well, Dorian. We're glad to have you back in town. Guys, do not forget to like and share this episode of Collider Movie Talk. Also, tell everybody you know we exist in podcast form as well. Check it out, spread the love, and tune in tomorrow, 3 p.m. PT Live for a brand new episode.